So ironically, in 2011, I became the thing that no physician wants to become. I became an interesting case. So I was diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in um, my late 40s. I don't have any siblings, so I had no great match for um, allogenic uh, stem cell transplants. So I actually researched other things and I found out about CAR T cell therapy. Uh, I searched myself. I found a trial that had an open space in several states away. I flew there, I was immediately accepted. And in September 2016, I received CAR T cell therapy, uh, one of the few, few first hundred in the world for lymphoma. So that was in September 2016, and here I am. The focus again is the latest in DLBCL treatments and research. And so for our doctors tonight, we have three, two who are specialists in uh, you know, lymphoma and one who is a three-time DLBCL survivor. So first with doctors Brody and Phillips, Dr. Brody um, is coming to us from Mount Sinai and Dr. Phillips is coming to us from City of Hope. So with that being said, let's set the stage a little bit here first. DLBCL, we hear about it a lot. Just a quick summary, but Dr. Brody, could you just sort of talk about what is DLBCL and what is the standard care for the first uh, line treatment? Sure. Uh, big question. I'll try to give a quick answer. Uh, DLBCL, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, is uh, the most uh, common. When I say the most common, we say the highest incident uh, lymphoma in America, in the world as well. Um, and so in America, about 90,000. Uh, people every year diagnosed with lymphoma, about 25,000 of those are diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, this is so frustrating to patients because uh, yeah, in some way you just say, you know, lung cancer is lung cancer. That's not even true, but it's a bit simpler. Lymphoma, you guys have all heard this, super complicated. We have about 80 four types of lymphoma. Uh, and then people say, wait, do I have the good one or not? Eh, it's not just two types. It's not the good one and the bad one. We divide these lymphomas into any way so we don't have to memorize a list of 84 things. The first way we divide them is first, and as you know, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. We are talking about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We divide non-Hodgkin's lymphoma into B-cell and T-cell lymphomas. So we're talking about a B-cell lymphoma. And then we sometimes divide B-cell lymphomas into low-grade versus aggressive. Low-grade, these grow very slowly, follicular lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, some others. And aggressive lymphomas, uh, diffuse large B-cell, again, the most common of them. Maybe you've heard of Burkitt's lymphoma, uh, mantle cell lymphoma, some of these other things that can grow more quickly. Um, and uh, the treatments for lymphoma, thankfully, uh, we're so lucky. Uh, because they have evolved more rapidly for lymphoma than for any other cancer in the world. Even though we are the fifth most common cancer lymphoma, uh, we have more FDA approved medicines than any other cancer, more than lung cancer, more than breast cancer. And the reason is, is because the, thankfully the progress has been very rapid. We don't get FDA approved medicines without progress to prove that those therapies can be pretty good. Um, the standard therapies for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma historically over the past 20 years, years has been, um, we always have these alphabet uh, recipes, R-C-H-O-P. It's not great branding, R-CHOP. It sounds a little aggressive. And, and it is, as uh, as Robin can tell you, uh, it is. It is a bit aggressive. Um, people that are working full-time before R-CHOP are frequently working part-time during R-CHOP. So it's aggressive enough that it, it affects your life in a real way. It affects your hair, uh, as you saw uh, from Robin's pictures. Uh, and uh, R-CHOP is aggressive, but not the most aggressive stuff we have. It is a standard therapy. Even today, it may not be the only standard frontline therapy. There are a couple of slightly new versions of our chop that are possibly options now. And I will say that in five years from now, I don't think our chop will be the standard. I think we'll even have uh, some better things. But our chop, you, I'm not going to go into all the details, but the R, you've heard of this thing called rituximab. It is an immunotherapy uh, targeting lymphoma, but using your immune system to kill those lymphoma cells. 
but that are not powerful enough by itself. So the CHOP is just regular old chemotherapy. The P is prednisone. So you've heard of that and not too tough, but the rest of that CHO is chemotherapy. All the side effects you've heard about with chemotherapy, hair falling out, a little bit of nausea, not so bad, but, but, but it's a real thing. And some of these other side effects you've heard about. The big punchline of our CHOP is thankfully, it cures about 60% of people uh, DLBCL, not every type of DLBCL, but overall uh, DLBCL. That's pretty good. We would say that people with, you know, metastatic breast cancer don't really have a cure. Uh, and so we would say we're lucky to be able to cure 60%. Not that lucky if you're in the other 40, though, uh, as, as as Robin or lots of our patients could tell you, we are very lucky for that other 40. We actually have uh, a lot of progress and probably still some curative things. Uh, I will say for patients who do not respond to our shop and immediately relapse, what we consider you know, primary refractory patients, and that likely extends out at least into the first six months. I think those patients have done very poorly historically with a lot of the standard options that we have, which our other alphabet soups like rice or DHAP, which are just various combination of chemotherapy drugs, hopefully cross um, that are not sort of uh, cross resistant to each other, provide a little bit different mechanism of action compared to the drugs used in CHOP with rituximab as well, with the goal of getting them to an autologous stem cell transplantation. Um, again, historically that group has done fairly poorly because they are probably chemo resistant, meaning that they're not gonna respond to any sort of chemotherapy drug, because the whole design of chemotherapy is to prevent DNA replication by causing DNA damage at some point during the replication cycle. So if a cancer drug has figured out a way to get past one, it likely has figured out a way to get past most of the rest. So, and then an auto transplant should really should be named an autologous stem cell rescue because it's still just more chemo. So it's not anything fancy about the stem cells that you're getting back. They're just your own stem cells to rescue your body. Um, I will say for the most part, for a lot of the clinical trials, it, tout these relapse refractory regimens. They're probably dependent heavily on re these relapse patients, which are generally the patients who relapse a year or so after chemotherapy. These are the reasons why we get the response rates for most of these regimens, such as, you know, the RICE and the DHAP, the big coral study, which was a big regimen looking at these uh, uh, relapse refractory regimens to see which one was better. I mean, they're really probably driven by refractory patients, again, because these sorry, relapse patients, because these refractory patients are not the ones that are going to drive these studies. So a lot of big emphasis recently has been on other ways to treat these patients, especially these early uh, refractory patients or patients who relapse within six months to a year with other regimens besides chemotherapy, which it brings into uh, the CAR-T discussion, which I'm sure we'll get into later. Um, for patients who can't get to CAR-T or who are ineligible for CAR-T, I mean, in the second line setting beyond chemotherapy, um, there is lenalidomide and tepacitamab, which are for patients who are in, ineligible for autologous stem cell transplantation. That regimen itself, at least from the clinical trial, seems to be more effective in those who have only received one line of therapy versus those who are heavily pretreated, uh, meaning they have two or more prior lines of therapy before receiving this drug. Um, really, in that second line setting, I mean, there aren't really a ton of other agents approved, even though we have options such as polituzumab, bendamustine, rituximab. I'll bet that regimen is a bit hesitant. We are a bit hesitant to use that regimen in some sense because it does, the bendamustine part does cause quite a bit of depletion of your immune system, specifically T cells. And the T cell depletion can be quite profound and prolonged, which can hamper things that depend on T cells to be effective, a la CAR-T, et cetera. Um, but there also is a new agent uh, recently is a CD19 drug antibody called called Lonkastuximab, uh, which has uh, a very different drug attached to it. It's a pyridinine uh, drug attached to it, which is a little bit different from MMAE, which is our usual antibody drug target. Um, so that is also another option. And then there's Selenexor, which is a export one inhibitor, which was approved of in this patient population, but probably has very little uptake because of the toxicity of the agent. So, but if we're looking at a currently approved agent to see the chemo or I mean, the resumes I just mentioned are the currently only approved ones outside of CAR-T at this point. Now, Dr. Brody, let's talk about CAR-T more in depth now, uh, since we've already talked about it, but what exactly is CAR-T cell therapy and what does it entail in terms of how people um, actually go through it? Uh, it sounds like science fiction, um, but literally uh, we take a little bit of a person's immune system, some immune cells from their blood. Um, in the old days, the old days meaning three years ago, uh, we shipped them off to Santa Monica, California, and, uh, and, and they literally do gene therapy on your immune cells. They put a new gene uh, into 
uh, into your immune cells. And that gene allows the, when we put those immune cells back into you uh, to go and first find lymphoma and then kill lymphoma. And, and, and humans have about 20,000 genes. This gene that they stick into those immune cells is not one of those 20,000. It's a made up gene. It's, we call it a Frankenstein gene. It's amalgamated from five other genes put together into one gene. That gene is called a CAR, a chimeric antigen receptor. You get some of this flu psy chemo, and then we reinfuse the CAR T cells. Um, very elegant science fiction, but it's it's here today. And just as a, a punchline of the efficacy, you know, a few years ago, we would say folks with multiply relapsed DLBCL didn't have curative options, just like patients with metastatic breast cancer. And in those patients, we would say the CAR T cells might cure 35, 40% uh, of patients. Going from what we call 0% to 40%, that sounds like a, it's miraculous. I mean, define miracle however you want. But, you know, it's a miracle if you don't think we can separate an ocean with our hands. Yeah, because it just can't be done. Well, you can't cure an incurable disease, except they did. They cured 40% of them, but still not 100%. So still a lot of room for improvement. The efficacy is therefore, you know, I would say very impressive, miraculously impressive, but it's not benign therapy. There is this risk of side effects, which are real. And probably, you know, maybe 20% of people get some of these high grade side effects. And the most commonly discussed one, we have a fancy name called cytokine release syndrome, CRS. Um, it's kind of like having a terrible infection, but there's actually no bacteria, no virus infecting you. Uh, and you can, people can land in the intensive care unit because of that. Uh, and another one we just call neurotoxicity, and we sometimes call it ICONS, I-C-A-N-S. We just call it neurotoxicity. And it can literally be a type of encephalopathy. People can literally start hallucinating, become unconscious. It can be dangerous. Um, and again, these high-grade toxicities, one of those two might happen in up to one in five patients. And, and even if it doesn't happen in the other four out of five, we don't know which one in five is going to happen to. So we have to monitor all of those patients uh, very closely, usually in the hospital. Well, with that being said, Dr. Phillips, if you could just touch on the, the benefits and the challenges. I mean, I think that is the biggest excitement is that, again, we've been all talking about immunotherapy, immunotherapy for decades. And here we are with an, a true immunotherapy with a much better safety and manageable safety profile than what we typically would see with an allogeneic stem cell transplantation. But I think to the point of the patient is what we see why the uptake of CAR-T is not what it should be. I mean, I think the last time we looked, you know, 20 to 5 to 30% of patients are probably getting CAR-T that are eligible. That means the vast majority of patients are not getting CAR-T due to access issues, I meaning they can't get to a, a CAR-T center or can, they can't necessarily have, they don't have anybody that needs to be there with them or relocate to a center for a month uh, to get CAR-T. So, I mean, these are all logistical challenges that we are trying to sort of fix and overcome, of, you know, along the way, but it, it's not been necessarily the easiest thing to, to get over because these patients will need caregivers, and especially as we're trying to move CAR-T to an outpatient setting. Again, I mean, they have to have somebody there that can take care of them just because financially, um, I don't think CAR-T is going to be feasible moving forward to stay where it was originally, where patients are hospitalized for 30 days, because fortunately, payers aren't going to pay for that. And so um, hospitals can't fit the bills for that any longer. So um, they do need some sort of support to help take care of them, which is not unfortunately dissimilar to what we see with transplant patients. But I mean, the hope is that, you know, that requirement and things like that may ease for some patients who aren't necessarily going through complications. But right now, unfortunately, it is a requirement at most centers that they have somebody to take care of them. I have a general question about refractory patients, right? So different in that the, whatever treatment, there's no response. It's not like it, you know, you were in remission and then you relapsed. It just didn't respond. So when would you consider CAR-T for someone in that position? Uh, thankfully now, uh, in second line. So that generally would be the immediate treatment at this point, unless there's some reason, you know, that they can't get the CAR-T. Uh, those patients should be the patients we get to CAR-T because uh, we already have two studies that have demonstrated that CAR-T was superior to autologous stem cell transplantation uh, with both AxiCell and then Lysacell uh, in this patient population. So this is the ideal patient population for CAR-T. Um, so easy answer, CAR-T.